Okay. Well, thank you very much, folks, for uh, coming out and listening to the presentation. So what I'm going to focus on today is to uh, help lay down the, the groundwork to identify vol damage and what are some of the results of the vol damage that we've been looking at or the monitoring of vol populations in blueberry fields. And what I want to start off with is how many folks here have actually have experienced vol damage in their plantations? So very many. Just one. Would you classify it as serious damage or as just minor damage? Would it be lots of damage? Lots? Okay, lots. Okay. So that's what we're trying to get a handle on is because there's some fields that generally have very little damage. Other fields have a lot of damage. Damage happens some years and not other years. And we're trying to get an understanding of when does this vol damage happen? Is there a link to something that we can control and prevent that damage? And so we've been doing some monitoring of vol damage for... Um, Five, and, five or six years so far. So what I'd like to do is just go through, talk a little bit about what are voles, how do they differ from mice, because there's lots of other critters that are in these um, blueberry plantations. What is classified as good vole habitat, then we can contrast that with what we actually are using or what the blueberry fields look like. What is the typical population dynamics of these guys? How do they change over time from year to year and within a year? to get a feeling of when is it most likely you could experience fall damage. And then from there, we'll actually look at the indices or what to look for to see if you have high vol abundance on your plantation. Then we're gonna go into the uh, vol monitoring study, what we've done over the five years. It's just gonna be a real short aspect. And then I'd like to make it a link to um, barn owls and other raptors that we have in the blueberry plantations. Up in um, BC, we have a number of raptors that are species of concern. And there's a fair number of them showing up now with rodenticide in the system. So we're trying to figure out is there a way of reducing rodenticide use or is there the best time to put rodenticide use to reduce the, rod the rodents on the site but yet not have a negative impact on the uh, raptors that are coming down to win overwinter in the lower mainland. And then I'll just come back with a summary on that. So first off, what are voles and how do they compare to mice? There's a lot of mice out in the fields. The vast majority of the animals when we do our live trapping are deer mice. I would think we usually would get one or two voles on a site, on some of the uh, heavier sites. And then we'd probably get 15, 18 deer mice. Sometimes we're getting 30 or 40 deer mice to one vole. So there's lots of other critters on these sites. And one of the things to look for on the mice, if you look at the, for deer mice, the back end of these guys are just really well developed. They're hopping through the fields. They're not running along the ground. They have very large ears, large eyes. They're nocturnal very large tail, kind of like a kangaroo for counterbalance because they're hopping. You compare that to a vole, these guys are just muscular, robust critters that push through the ground. In fact, when you look at them, the front part of the voles are way better developed than the small back end of the voles because they're really digging through the ground, pushing through the, the grass, the thatch, the organic layer, and they're just really well developed. They generally have smaller eyes, smaller ears, and short tails. So they're just very different. And the reason I mention it is because the voles are the ones that are causing damage to the plantations and the deer mice are not. The deer mice are seed eaters. They're eating the grass seed, the seeds from herbaceous plants, and they're eating all the remaining blueberries that are laying on the ground. And they're not causing any damage to the bushes directly. Voles, they're, they're eating the grasses. They're eating the flesh of the grass. And when you start having the nutrients of the blueberry bushes coming in, to, when it starts being pulled from the plant into the root system in the fall, the base of the plant is very nut nutritious because of all the sugars being concentrated there. And then the voles are eating it like it's a grass blade going after those sugars that are being concentrated there and going after the root system at the same time where the concentration of the nutrients are there. So the deer mice don't do that. Mostly it's voles. So it's not all critters running around in the blueberry fields are the evil Townsend vole that's here. The Townsend vole is the biggest vole we have in North America. It gets the highest population density of any North American vole species. So we were blessed with one of the biggest guys who gets the highest density. And we know pretty well the least about the Townsend and vole compared to the other ones. The best habitat for voles, or in specifically the Townsend vole, the one that's here and in, in the lower mainland of BC, are these really lush, wet, moist uh, meadows. They love the grasses, the sedges, and it's the grass habitat they're looking for. Same with if it's in a forested environment, like Vancouver Island, it's the only vole there, so it actually inhabits the forest as well. It's very lush forest with lots of herbaceous material that they're eating. So this is the optimum habitat. One of the questions is, how does that compare to blueberry fields? And where are the vole, what's the density relative to blueberry fields? If that's the optimum, 
where does the blueberry field stand with their level of bowl abundance? And then next phase with the bowls, let's like say they're one of the largest ones we have, they go through a number of different cycles. And I want to point out the first one. I'm just going to use the laser pointer. Most of the vol species always start off very low in the springtime. They've, um, they're only the adults that survived over winter. They didn't get eaten by the weasels, the hawks, and the owls that are feeding on them. And then during the summer, they start increasing in numbers until they reach a peak into the fall. Generally, they stop reproducing in the fall. All the young have been kicked out, and now it's just a matter of animals are being lost from the population, so the population decreases back to a low number again in spring, and then they start the process over again. So generally in the spring is the lowest density of bulls and small mammals in general out there, and then they increase to really high numbers in the fall. And that's when you get the high numbers in the fall that generally damage is most likely to happen is when you have all the young of the year looking for a place to stay. Some of them get pushed into suboptimal habitats. There's not much food, so they start going after the blueberry bushes. And that's the same time the blueberry bushes are bringing in all the sugars from the leaves and the stems and concentrate them in the roots, or at least that's the way in forest plantations with the shrubs and the trees, bringing those nutrients in for point in dormancy, and then that concentrates the nutrients and damage happens. The other aspect is some years there's very high abundance of voles, other years there's not very many voles on the site. And typically voles go through this three to five year cycle where they have peaks every three to five years. And the general pattern is it's during these peaks when the damage actually happens. So if we can start predicting those peaks, then that's the time that you can start putting in some type of um, integrated pest management system to reduce the voles rather than spending money during the intervening years when there's not going to be very much damage or the vole population is low. So we're just trying to get a grasp of that. This data here is just the number of individuals we've captured on some sites over three years. And this data is primarily for the long-tailed vole in the interior of BC. We're just, no one's really studied the Townsend vole. And that's the main one here that we have in the lower mainland and in this area. And like I say, the voles, they get the biggest ones, they get the highest density of any of the vole species in North America. They can breed from late February to October, um, gestation's 21 days. During those peak periods, so the female is um, pregnant, the gestation, she gives birth on day 21. During those peak periods, she can go out, get impregnated again that same day, and then 21 days later, she gives birth again. And this can go on for nine or 10 times throughout the summer and into the fall. So these guys have a huge capacity to produce a lot of young, but they're also territorial. And so they don't keep the young with them. When that next litter comes on, the young are kicked out, and then the, the next litter is taking up that part of the, the territory. This happens in the best habitat, those really lush grass meadows. So one of the questions is, what's happening in the blueberry fields? So just to, to um, put the numbers potentially, these guys, you can get a production of 16,000 voles per hectare over that whole summer during a high population of voles. Typically, they run about 650 to 800 per hectare during the peak, but then these guys typically crash, and when they crash, they go down to pretty well one or zero per hectare. It's just trying to figure out where are they in the blueberry fields, and when do those peaks happen to prepare for the damage that may happen as a result of that. So one of the things, like I say, the peaks happen in the best habitat. It's happening up into these uh, nice lush meadows, grass fields. Even though the blueberry fields, so these are some of the exceptions, are not overly grassy habitats, one thing that we've noticed is what you need to be vigilant is what's happening all the way around the blueberry field. Do you have lots of grass being developed here? Is there a crop that's, being that's growing? And then in the fall, when the vole population is the highest, the crop gets harvested, there's no cover, they all start getting into the best refuge they can, which could be a blueberry field. Or is the adjoining grass field being flooded and they have nowhere to go, they come onto your blueberry fields. If your fields flood, generally you don't find very many voles in flooded fields because the ground's saturated, the voles aren't there. But if you have drainage tiles, then, and you're actually probably the only island of dry habitat in a sea of um, flooded fields, then you can have these huge influxes in the fall during the rainy period when the plants are the most nutritious or most of the concentrations happening at the uh, base of the trees or the bushes and in the roots, and then damage could happen. So you got to look around what's happening in the fields beside you to help um, predict whether you might encounter some bowl damage on your sites. So voles can come from um, the harvested sites. I know this is in a popular plantation. There's zero voles all through summer. We kind of stopped monitoring. We caught none. Then I walked around four weeks later, and there was voles everywhere. 
I looked at all the neighboring fields. They were just harvested in that fall. And then they all just, there was no cover, they moved in. So just looking for that. Flooded sites, if you have drainage on your site, you could be um, initiating or pr providing the best habitat in the area for voles to come into. And again, just to mention, they do peak every three to five years. Typically, we just don't know what the Townsend vole does. So some of the questions we have are, do voles regularly live in blueberry fields? Is it optimal habitat? Is it suboptimal habitat? Is damage only occurring during the high abundance or is damage chronic in the field? So if you even have a few voles per hectare, they're eating the tree, the bushes, or is it only happening when you get these gray areas and there's a peak on the site? There's so many voles, then more voles than there's food, so then they revert to the blueberry bushes. So we're trying to figure out what's happening with these guys. So one of the things is to look at what does bowl damage look like and there's a number of indices or um, cues that you can look at when you're out there trying to see do you have an, a bowl population increasing in your blueberry fields. And the first one is the number of holes that you see, the tunneling that they do. These guys burrow, it's the only bowl again being the largest, the highest density and it's also the one that um, is one of the few that actually burrow into the ground. You can see what we call the vole holes. And these guys are about two inches in diameter. This is different from the mouse. The mice holes are only about an inch in diameter. The vole holes are about two inches in, in diameter. But the vole holes, they last for generation after generation. Underneath the blueberry bushes, there's this whole network of tunnels that's going through there. Even though the voles could crash or disappear from the site or get flooded out of the site, those tunnels still stay there and the holes are there. The better indices is looking for the runways. Because if the runways aren't being used, the grass is going to fill it in, grow up through the runways, and it's, you can say this is a low vole year because there's no active runways. When the voles are actually running through there, you will see these really clear paths underneath the grass, and that would be one of the signs to say, I might have a vole problem, I need to prepare, do something about it for this coming winter, because the peak is always in the fall and the winter time. But the deer mice, they don't have runways because they hop, and their, their holes are much smaller because they're a much smaller critter compared to the, uh, the vole. And here's one out of a fresh blueberry field. This is one of our anomalies. Hardly any grass on the site, but lots of voles. But there's drainage tiles, and we think it's the flooded uh, grass field around that caused this influx of voles. And then the tunnels are there. But you can see even in the... Um, in the bark mulch, a really clear pathway leading into this hole, saying that this is a really active hole. This, in fact, the bark mulch was only put out a few weeks before this, and there was just dozens of holes all through this area. And so a real clear sign that, uh, that um, this producer is going to be experiencing bowl damage, and this producer experiences chronic bowl damage. Something different, because it's one of the few fields we've seen that actually has regular bowl damage on it. Most fields, we don't find very many act or sign of bowls. So again, looking for the... Um, the two inch diameter holes on the site looking for the runways would be the best indicators if you have holes on your site but i want to point out there's no dirt piles around these holes that's quite important because the one of the other critters on the site is the mole and you've got the vole with a v mole with an m these guys are just eating insects and primarily earthworms on the site they're digging they push up the mounds of dirt leaving these dirt piles but they're they're essentially a non-issue in blueberry fields from the fact that they're just eating insects they're not causing any damage to the, the uh, bushes themselves and in in the lower mainland in bc we have the towns and vole or mole which is an endangered species there's only a few in a number of hundreds just in the sumas prairie so we want to be cautious about what um, what we're managing for so what does this damage look like? If you have plants that are declining or dead and you want to pull them up out of the ground and take a look at them, the one on the left is actually from a, a nursery. And typically what happens is the voles will completely eat the root systems. Um, again, these root systems are packed full of the sugars from the photosynthate when, in the fall when it's all being relocated to the root systems. And then the other major type of damage is they're just digging through the rows of blueberries leaving tunnels and they do take away some of the root systems there but we found many of these fully intact root systems with hardly any roots being removed but then you have this type where the whole base of the bush has been completely removed 
by voles during very intense feeding. Some of the uh, fact, fact that we fertilize these bushes really intensifies the amount of feeding that happens from these guys. There's other critters that also leave, that do debarking and girdling damage, the weevils. So I want to emphasize how you tell vole damage from weevil damage. And just take a look at the circle here. Oh, it's going to be highlighted in the next little, um, in the next slide. You're looking for these little multitude of scratches everywhere, and they're always parallel. There's always two together. And if you notice the teeth of voles, this is actually a pocket gopher. I can't get a vole to smile like that to do that. But if you look at just even the shape of the teeth, there's that little V-shape, the upper incisors, low incisors meet. And as a consequence, you always get these parallel marks with a little bit of unchewed bark in between where the teeth meet. And you'll always find these parallel marks for vole damage. And that's not going to be noticeable when you have weevil damage on the site. And we do think some folks will, might uh, misinterpret weevil damage as vole damage, because you might have mouse holes in the site and then you see some debarking and you link the two together but um, there seems to be maybe a little there's a potential that it's actually weevil damage and not vole damage. Weevil damage is also the debarking um, taking the cambium foam tissue off but you don't get those really clear incisor grooves on the uh, the bowl of the tree or the bush to indicate that it's actually a rodent chewing that. Um, so there's quite prevalent on the site. I don't know much about the weevil aspects, but I've been told that there's a fair bit of this chewing the root systems as well. So you need to have that package of both the tunneling, the, um, the runways, and those parallel grooves on, the, on the, uh, the root system or the bowl of the tree at their base to indicate that you have bowl damage on the site. And you're just definitely looking for those parallel teeth that are just quite obvious. One of the concerns though is if the bush starts getting older, it starts sapping up a little bit, it, it's full of dirt, it's hard to see those, so you may have to wash it off, get a magnifying glass out to take a look at it. I often look right at the base where the bark has been removed and you'll see these little parallel U-shaped marks where the teeth have gone in, which you wouldn't see that on the weevil damage. So. So just a little bit about our monitoring. Um, what have we noticed over the last few years? We've been doing a pilot study the first year and then we've on to a five year monitoring program. And this is just the last year that we were moving into. So I'll just show you some of the differences we've noticed in the fields that we monitored. During the pilot study, we went out and measured a number of blueberry bush or farms, looking at what is their relationship between the abundance of tunneling and holes with some physical feature. We looked at water on the site, the amount of vegetation on the site, height and age of the bushes, and the strongest, and actually the only sign that came back significant was the amount of grass on the site. The more grass you had, you had a significant number, significantly more um, tunneling and vole holes on the site than those sites that had low grass. So then we moved on to a five-year study looking at is grass management a way to reduce the vole damage. So then we've had these areas with number of replicates with low where there's been cultivated between the rows and then bark mulch on the uh, blueberry bushes. And then we have medium grass sites where there's mowing between the rows. The grass doesn't get very tall but then the rows themselves have bark, bark mulch. And then the high site is just a continuous covering of grass or herbaceous material throughout. And then the control to say, how do these guys compare to their optimum habitat or fully grass fields? And then we did some monitoring through live trapping and ear tagging to get the, uh, an estimate of the actual numbers of voles on these sites. Now the first graph is for the mice because we just monitor everything we capture. And one of the patterns initially during that pilot study Mice love the sites without any grass. They're primarily eating the seeds or the, the drop berries from these sites. The high sites, the high grass and control, there wasn't very many deer mice there. But then when we moved the study south and went on to the four, five year study, the deer mice are everywhere on these sites. Um, they are just prevalent all through these fields. They're habitat generalists and they are in very high abundance on these sites. When we get to the vole, Again, we have the low grass, medium grass, high grass, and controls. During the pilot project, we found some voles on these really clean sites. And then when I'm trying to figure it out, I noticed there's a forage field or a grass field right beside it. And then the, the live trapping sites were within just a few rows off of that field. So I think we were getting an influx from the heavy grass sites beside that. When we relocated the study to the Richmond Ladner area, consistently, this is the number of animals captured. This is the four years of the study so far. We've got zero on low grass sites. And sometimes on medium, we've picked up some bulls. Sometimes there's equals high grass sites. But the general trend is, this is control, but there's always this trend of 
um, varied or no voles on low grass sites to higher numbers on the high grass sites throughout the study. And so there is some relationship between the amount of grass, which is their main food source, and the abundance of voles on these sites. What we don't know is if high grass leads to damage, because right now we're dealing with, on average, one or two voles per field in the area that we're trapping. So we got 20 traps out and two transects. And that's obviously these guys at this very low stage, they're not. So we may cover about an acre with our traps and have voles that peak out about three to five hundred per acre and we're getting ones and twos generally in blueberry fields the voles are very low compared to the sites that have a lot of grass these sites are just the baseline to say what would be there if it was a grassy habitat and without a doubt the blueberry fields appear to be suboptimal sites for them they're just not in there very much but the concern is when these high grass sites really produce the voles for that peak are they going to start coming in in large numbers into the blueberry fields. So we've been hoping to trap these long enough that we encounter one of those peaks, but we haven't encountered them yet. Over the six years, they've just been very low in the blueberry fields. So we don't think the blueberry fields in general have a high abundance of voles. It's suboptimal habitat. But there are these unique features around there that may induce some sites to be chronic vole damage, such as the flooding, the grassy fields around, and they come onto the, um, the blueberry field as if it was an island that they can reside in. So I want to mention just about the link with the um, burrowing owl or the, the uh, barn owl and the number of other predatory birds we have. But this is one of the highest concentration of overwintering um, hawks and owls in the lower, lower mainland in this area. They're all coming from the north and from the east to overwinter here and they need that food source. And they're constantly going after the deer mice, but mostly the voles. The, uh, the barn owl pretty well, it looks like 80 to 90% of its diet is the Townsend bull here. And so we have a bit of an issue with, in our neck of the woods, is that the number of owls that are coming in that have been hit by cars or found dead are having a very high level of rodenticide in them. And they're trying to figure out where is this rodenticide coming from. And so we've been just looking at if we can understand if it's, um, there's a lot of uh, rod um, rodenticide tubes out in blueberry fields. We're trying to figure out, is this needed all of the time? Or is it only a small window that the voles are going to be causing a problem? And are there even enough voles in the fields for the owls to be working on or focusing on to get that rodenticide? So that's just coming in now is to try to monitor what is the issue here with rodenticide and where are these guys getting it from? My thoughts so far is generally blueberry fields, they're at, first off, the voles are generally at this low phase. We haven't really seen a peak for a long time. And the blueberry fields would be more represented by these clear squares relative to the optimum habitat, which could represent by these high squares. Blueberry fields are suboptimal habitat. We're not catching many voles in these fields. So I don't think that's the source of where the rodenticide's coming from. It might be coming from somewhere else. But if we could look at the um, pattern of the voles, Avoid putting rodenticide out in the spring and summer when the voles are generally very low. Look at the tunnels, looking at the runways to see, self-assess, am I going to come up to a high vole year? What's happening around me? And if that's the case, then you can um, then narrow in and put rodenticide out at that time rather than during all these intervening years when essentially there's um, not much damage going to happen and you're probably putting a lot of money out there that may not need to go out there. So some of the questions and what can you do? Is there a lot of vegetation in your fields? Do you, are, do you keep them very clean or is it really, um, really weedy? If it's really weedy, you might have a potential have mold damage on your site. Are you next to grass fields? Do these fields flood? Do you, if your fields flood, that's great. It generally gets these guys out. But if neighboring fields flood and you're high and dry, you might be the island that they come in on. So that could lead to high vole damage and that might lead to more chronic vole damage because it artificially increases the number of voles relative to the food source that you have. Um, so the best way is to walk your field, self-assess, look for those tunnels that are two inches diameter and the fresh runways to indicate I have voles on the site. Tunnels, the holes can last for generations, but the runways are the ones that show you if you have active vole sites. Right after a snow, if it snows and melts, that's the perfect time to go and look for these runways because it's really obvious at that time. And then if you are in that area, we have lots of sign of voles, then you, at that time would be the time to use rodenticide rather than chronic um, throughout the summer and fall when you may not be needing that, um, that particular management strategy. So just an overview. 
bull biology. They're very, we have tons and tons of deer mice on these sites. They were just designed differently compared to the bull. I know some books call my, uh, bulls field mice, but it's just the bull that causes the damage. They're in the best habitat is the grassy fields. And if we can remove the grass from the fields, it's less likely we'll have voles there. If you're trying to identify vole damage, look for those parallel tooth marks and look for those grooves on it to indicate that it's vole damage rather than, say, weevil damage. And then try to figure out what's happening with the population. The best time is going to be in the wintertime when you get high abundance of voles, but the runways can tell you are you at the low numbers or are you coming up to one of these high peaks. That could happen in the next few years. We just don't know what towns and voles do. Um, generally, it's always three to five years, but these guys are an anomaly. They're just different. And again, this, the data over the five years has shown that low grass sites generally have very low bowl abundance, actually none if it's cultivated. But overall, we're getting one in two bowls per um, study site, which is relatively low than what their potential really, really is and compared to control sites. The concern is when the control sites get saturated, they may start spilling into these sites. And that's where you need to be vigilant and just checking for those runways to see if you need to start doing some type of... Uh, control. But if you did long-term veg management control, it's probably one of the best ways to keep them permanent or low on your site and give you the best buffer against bowl damage. And lots of people to folk are thanked through the Ministry of Agriculture, the berry specialists, and there's a huge thank you to all the producers that gave us access to their fields and have been allowing us to monitor the, the voles on their sites for the past six years or so. <laughs> and any questions? Any questions at all? Anybody awake? Come on. It's very interesting. Thank you. Oh, there is one. We have a winner. Do you have any recommendations for uh, inorganic if there's not rodenticides available? Is there any other? We've done some mass trapping, some of that. It's real hard to get the trapping's kind of hard to get the the mice down or voles down. What other methods for organic have you worked with? So we, um, one uh, producer did try doing the trapping, but he said he was very unsuccessful in trying to get the voles off the site. He just didn't catch any. Um, he had one site where part of the field flooded and they all went up to the highest part and then that site got hit with vole damage. Um, but he was unsuccessful. Trapping is quite labor intensive to constantly because one of the concerns is if the voles are coming onto your site, you're not trying to get them off your site by itself. You're trying to depopulate the whole area around you because during those peak years, it's a non-stop influx onto your site. The best thing to do is try to prevent them from getting onto your site. There has been some trials with voles in the interior of BC for forestry plantations to use supplemental food because what happens is when the voles come in, they will peak to that high number and they will literally crash down to zero a few months later. And it's not, you're not trying to necessarily get rid of the voles. You're trying to postpone their feeding on the blueberry bushes till they naturally just die out. And so they've been using these called these little pucks, but um, we're still, I guess, waiting. It's um, the Applied Mammal Research Institute out of uh, Summerland has been testing those and he's trying to see what is the advantage? He's been doing it for a number of years. I just don't know what the results of the study are. There's been other studies trying to put weasel chemicals out to try to scare these guys out, and it doesn't work very well. Um, I wrap my mind around it. I'm not, like I said, generally a huge fan of rodenticide, but because that crash is going to happen anyways, then rodenticide would just encourage it to happen sooner before the damage happened. That, I think that's fine, as long as if the uh, owls and the other um, secondary predators are not getting hit with it. Um, but if you're doing like organics where you can't put them in, um, that's a hard one. I think just controlling the grass the best you can to keep them out of your site is a lot easier than um, trying to get them off of your site once they've already become established on the site, if that's possible. So. Increase the barn owl. Well, you need barn owls though at night, because he's saying they're... They're out and about more at night. Okay, the hawks are going to go after rabbits and other things. Yep. That's just coming from an old birder here. So, you know, build small barns. Because <laughs> everybody's tearing down the old barns, right? I think combination of grass reduction and enhancing predators are great. The thing is, when you have that influx of voles coming onto your site, if that's what's happening, no predator can keep up with those. That's just, that's, that's, that's yeah. biology. That's why they're designed that way. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.